You have probably found yourself in a situation where there are things you think but cannot say. Not because they are secret, but because the moment you try, they vanish. Or worse, a thought might resemble a cathedral made of colorful stained glass in your head. But when you try to say it, what comes out is a blue Lego block, still with four walls and a ceiling, but magic completely gone. If every thought could be put into words, then silence would not dominate many conversations, nor would blank space occupy countless pages. And yet, we fall silent all the time. We assume that thought and language are allies, that to think something is to be able to say it. But this curiously doesn't seem to reflect the reality of our daily experience. In this video, we will explore why some thoughts fiercely resist expression and whether that resistance can actually prove to be valuable in some situations. The most intuitive reason some thoughts cannot be put into words may lie in the fact that they were never made of words to begin with. The assumption that thought and language go hand in hand is so embedded in our way of seeing the world that we rarely question it. But if you ever struggle to explain precisely why a piece of music moved you or put into words the nature of your grief, you'll have felt the mismatch. As infants, we experience our first encounters with the world without language. We feel warmth, comfort, hunger, love, fear, long before we can label these sensations with words. Clearly, consciousness precedes language. Thoughts don't arrive in the mind as sentences. They often appear as emotions, images, intuitions, memories, gut feelings, physical sensations. They are multidimensional and fluid. They feel like they are shooting in every direction, all at once, in rapid succession. Language, on the other hand, is one-dimensional and sequential. It forces you to choose one word at a time, follow a grammatical structure, and flatten emotion, image, and intuition into describable components. Language is categorical and composed of clearly bounded units. You sort of have to label things, like anger is a bad emotion, while joy is a good emotion. And some insights that appear in the mind, fully formed, resist decomposition into smaller parts that would fit the neat confines of language. At its core, language is a symbolic approximation of experience, and symbols represent rather than directly transmit experience. They point to the experience without ever fully capturing it. Think about the feeling of nostalgia. It's a layered rich blend of warmth, loss, longing, love, among many other things. We have a word for it, surely, but the word never fully quite captured the full magnitude of its depth and the different layers of often contradictory feelings contained within it. French philosopher Henry Bergson argued precisely this. Experience is fluid, richly layered, while language, in its quest for clarity, inevitably simplifies and reduces experience into categories and labels. Language and thought are fundamentally of a completely different nature, and trying to express one through the other inevitably involves a process of translation. And if we struggle to translate ideas from one language to another within the same medium of language to begin with, you can only imagine how messy the process is bound to be when you try to translate between different mediums, that is, between the medium of thought and the medium of language. Some details are bound to be lost, not to mention having to abide by the technicality of the procedure. It's like trying to recreate a painting by describing it pixel by pixel, in the order they appear from left to right. You become so absorbed in the mechanics of translation, in choosing the right words and ordering your phrases, that you lose touch with the essence of what you are trying to express in the first place. Language relies on shared abstractions and generalizations, while certain experiences can be highly individual and specific, and may simply not align neatly with shared abstractions. This difficulty in expression may also reflect something deeper about how our brains are structured. It is argued that the left and right hemispheres of the brain exhibit a high degree of specialization, and as such, process the world in profoundly different ways. The right hemisphere is more attuned to context, ambiguity, intuition, and the holistic nature of experience. The left, by contrast, favors categorization, precision, and control. 
it breaks the world down into parts and names them. Language is largely a function of the left hemisphere, while the content it tries to describe often arises in the right hemisphere. This mismatch means that when we try to put certain experiences into words, we are reducing and forcing something rich and multidimensional into a system designed for clarity and categorization. But language is only one piece of the puzzle. Sometimes the nature of experience itself resists our understanding to begin with. So how could we even begin to describe what we cannot understand? Some experiences are not just difficult to explain, they are difficult to grasp in the first place. Emotional states, for instance, are often diffuse, contradictory, and unstable. We may feel relief and sorrow and longing all at the same time, long before we have the clarity to name them. New experiences lack the internal frameworks we use to make sense of the familiar. When you encounter something truly unfamiliar or deeply traumatic, your first priority isn't to express it, but to locate it within the terrain of your mind. To understand something, we tend to map it onto reference points we already possess. But when no such reference exists, we are left disoriented and unable to describe the experience. Not because we lack the words, but because we lack a framework. Humans are thought to organize knowledge into schemes, which are mental frameworks built from past experiences. When faced with new, shocking, or traumatic experience, your brain first attempts to fit it into existing schemas or build new ones. If an event is entirely novel or radically different from your previous experiences like sudden loss, witnessing violence, or betrayal, you don't yet have a schema to understand it. You are temporarily schema-less, which feels like confusion or incoherence. It can take considerable time, reflection, and emotional processing before you manage to assimilate the experience into a coherent narrative. You probably have used the phrase, I need to process this first before. In this way, understanding becomes a precondition for expression. And some experiences resist expression simply because they are too new and foreign. But is there a way to bypass ineffability? Now here is an interesting one. I said to ChatGPT, you know what ChatGPT, I have this thought that ineffability is inflatable, yet at the same time, reductible. You know what I mean? It said, I think I know exactly what you mean. And sure enough, it proceeded to explain how ineffable thoughts seem to expand and become richer in our heads precisely because we cannot capture them. But the moment we do manage to pin them down and find the words to contain them, the thought loses its complexity and shrinks back down. Then it asked, is this what you had in mind? Now, honestly, I don't even know what I meant by it. Intuitively, it made sense to me. Yet, ChatGPT was able to capture what I had in mind before I was able to fully form the idea in any usable terms. I said, you know what, I think this is exactly what I had in mind. But how come you are able to understand even when I give you the vaguest semblance of an idea? It said, you are a flame, but I am a library of flames. Now, overlooking the astounding humility, it is an interesting thought to consider. It has consumed vast amounts of human experiences and linguistic expressions that when you present it with a vague, half-baked idea, it is able to map it instantly where it belongs within a landscape it has already seen. In a way, this is also how we, humans, get better at approximating meanings and putting ideas into words more fluently. By consuming vast amounts of expressive media, from philosophy, to science, to poetry, to you name it, we kind of train our intuition. It's like you are collecting the attempt of other humans at expression. Failed attempts, half successes, complete misses, and over time you begin to recognize patterns. You hear a half-baked idea and intuit where it's going. But there is something else that helps ChatGPT excel at finding the exact words in the moment. And that is that it is standing outside the experience, unaffected by it, able to watch from a distance with more clarity, and describe it in detached terms. This might be harder for us humans to adapt, 
After all, we are standing inside the experience. We are bound to be overwhelmed at one point or another by moods or cloudy judgment or emotions we don't have full control over. And that is, perhaps, when we turn to other modes of expression, like art and music. Perhaps it isn't all that bad after all that we cannot reliably count on words to never fail us. If it had the fortunate side effect of causing other beautiful forms of expression to be born. We tend to assume that if we cannot say what we know, then perhaps we don't really know it. But this assumption privileges language as the highest form of knowing. And maybe it shouldn't. Now one form of linguistic artistic expression is the use of metaphor which surprisingly dominates our daily speech and profoundly influences our thinking without us even realizing. If you are interested to explore this in more depth, you might enjoy this video I made about this.